thanks for having me here today. I'm very excited to be speaking to you all. I think uh, you're all probably first or second year MBA students, yes? Yes. <laughs> Do they cover all of the bases? MBA programs are like two years long, right? Okay, good. So, good. Good guesses, first or second year MBA students. And you're all about to be going out onto what I think is a really, really interesting uh, entrepreneurial market, particularly around data. Um, my background, as Greg already said, uh, I went to a liberal arts college for undergrad where I studied math and physics. And then grad school, I went and studied applied math. I was in a PhD program, thought I wanted to be a professor, and then I realized I did not want to be a professor. And so the easiest escape hatch when you're studying applied math and you don't want to be a professor is to come to Silicon Valley, almost certainly. Um, at that point, I started working at a company called Weeby Data, which was started by one of Cloudera's founders and their first uh, employee. There I worked on something called the Kiji Project, which is a platform for real-time machine learning model application. So lots of words in one phrase. <laughs> and I'm going to talk quite a bit about the Kiji project today and how we can use it for real-time, responsive machine learning applications. Uh, the first half, first section of my talk, I'm going to generally talk about what I think is the data science landscape, what sort of tools and segments of it exist, and then begin to talk about this real-time machine learning platform and how it can be used for retail recommendation engines, which you're already probably familiar with through Amazon. Uh, what I'm hoping that you all get out of the real-time machine learning platform section <laughs> is a few things. One, uh, enough to ask good questions when people try to tell, sell you something fast by telling you it's real-time. Uh, and two, hopefully more information about the infrastructure that goes around these machine learning applications that people are building at companies. And so, Please, I, I don't often encourage people to interrupt me in the middle of my talks with questions, but this is an exception. I would love uh, any questions that come up during the talk to be answered as it goes so I don't lose anyone. So you, do you all agree you're going to interrupt me with questions if you have them? <laughs> I need a good affirmative. Great. Great. Then I will uh, dive head in and hopefully this will be a lot of fun. So as Greg mentioned, I'm a data scientist at Cloudera. Uh, Cloudera is an enterprise data management uh, software provider. We build all of this on top of Hadoop. And what we expect people to do with that is to take a ton of their data, all different kinds, anything that they can collect, anything they think is valuable, and put it inside of Cloudera, a CDH cluster. Once it's there, hopefully they will then do something with it beyond just you know regulatory compliance, depending on their industry. Uh, and usually this means having data scientists or data analysts, people that are actually going to use that data to make something useful. Um, I frequently get asked what a data scientist is. Sometimes I brush it off with like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> what, did, what are they doing in their job? That's probably what the data scientist does. Uh, but I guess it probably deserves a real answer. And <laughs> who am I kidding? It deserves a funny answer. And so this one's from Josh Wills, who's my boss. And his definition, which I really like, is a person who's better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician. So, a dilettante. <laughs> um, if we try to be glib, we can say that. Uh, but clearly, it's something that covers many different skills and collection of skill sets. What I see in practice is a few different categories of skills that people that call themselves data scientists fall into. Um, I think people that were the original creators of the term data scientist continue to use their original definition. Um, I've seen, I think, you know, English is an evolving language and linguistics gives us lots of opportunities to continue to evolve it. And the way that I see data science, this title applied, it's now covering, in my mind, three different areas. So there's data plumbing, which is making sure data is in the right place to be used for however it is you want to use it. Um, there's a lot of different data. <laughs> there's a lot of different types of data. There's a lot of different scales of data, both in terms of quantity and the speed that it might be coming in. Uh, and you need expertise on how to handle these sort of situations. And so, so there's people that are setting up these systems. I would call them data engineers. Sometimes they are called data scientists. There's also investig investigative analytics. Um, I think this is the part of data science that's closest to traditional BI, intelligence, analytics, um, 
you can imagine these are the sorts of people who are building weekly reports for you, uh, maybe regularly asking important business questions, maybe running A-B tests. Um, this is digging into sort of stationary, stationary in some sense data. If you have an enterprise data warehouse, you're going to go answer some questions about it. <coughs> and then the third part is what I call operational analytics. And so, actually this is a nice better diagram. <coughs> operational analytics, which in a second, operational analytics in my mind is operationalized machine learning. So building these types of applications that are responsive and give you something interesting uh, that wouldn't happen if you just sort of sent a message to a server and it wasn't doing any fun math in the background. So examples of this include Google Search, <coughs> Amazon's recommendations, um, Google Maps. And I think a lot of the uses that I see now are taking huge amounts of information that couldn't be organized any other way and making it more accessible. So I think of search as exactly the problem of how do you work, you know, Google is answering the problem, how do you organize the world's information? Well, you use some fancy machine learning to make it easier to get at the pieces that you want. And that's a kind of common theme that you see. You had a question. Uh, one question. So what, what type of companies approach you uh, in the sense of asking for these services? Are you seeing that early age startups gain much about entering the data science world? Or this is more of a medium-sized, already functional company that kind of wants to get more efficient, wants to get more uh, precise? So I think it de the answer kind of differs depending on if you're on the operational side or the exploratory side. Are you asking about the operational side? Uh, in, in general. In general? I, I think I've seen all types of companies try to use use these methods. I think it really depends on Especially like you, your point, and I think what your question was getting at is, do small companies, can some small companies put this off for a while if they're not trying to opt, optimize some sort of internal business process? And I think it depends on the company. I was, the, my job prior to Cloudera, between Weeby Data and Cloudera, was building um, risk models and lists of sections of oil and gas pipelines that needed maintenance. So they have a ton of data about what exists in pipelines, what is going on in them, how their coatings are doing, how their wall thickness is doing. They can't aggregate it together well. And they basically have humans sit down and are like, eh, this feels fine, <laughs> you know? Uh, and adding more standardization and rigor around how you figure out what needs maintenance, like that, that's something that's fundamentally valuable and important to that tiny startup's business. So I, I would say that there are that the question depends on the context and it's hard to answer definitively broadly. So I want to talk through some examples of the three parts of data science as data plumbing or investigative analytics and operational analytics. This is a diagram of data flow that is being processed. Um, it's big and loopy and complicated and, and I'm glad that mostly other people do this for me. <laughs> And the people that were making that big, loopy, complicated ETL sort of diagram are people that have a lot of data that they need to reliably ingest and do something interesting with. And so here is an example of, uh, I believe this is Skybox Imaging. Yeah. So Skybox Imaging, their business is to build these tiny satellites and put up a lot of them so that they can have frequently updated, very high resolution images of the surface of the Earth. And so that, in and of itself, really cool. Uh, but constantly streaming back from satellites to Earth to a data center and not losing any of these images. Um, high resolution photography is very computationally and data intensive. And so their issue is that they need to continuously ingest these sources, do some processing on them, and store them in some reasonable way. And so the way that they do that is with Hadoop, HBase, as a way to uh, have easy access to individual sections of the earth or pieces of the map that they might need to get. And then also Uzi, which is a mechanism for scheduling different types of jobs you need. Um, so if data comes in, it lands one place, five minutes later this other process is going to run and your pipeline continues to flow. So for them, they're, they know what type of data processing they need to apply to each of these images. They have these C++ libraries that get the interesting information out. 
They just need to continuously ingest and reliably get it to the right place. The reliability is the hard part here. It's just it should get to scale. Oh no. Oh. Okay. The relief when you realize there's an animation <laughs> and images are not missing from your slides. <laughs> <laughs> So this is an example, I think, of someone using, what is that? That is Spotfire, this thing in the background. Um, they're answering some questions, you know, using an R, I think this is R Studio, uh, to make some graphs. Here you can see they're using ggplot just from the color palette um, in their plots. And like obviously they're trying to see, like, oh, okay, what's happening in different areas of the city. Um, this is not the part that excites me the most, and so you can kind of tell. <laughs> so there's a company called Marks & Spencer, which is a big English retailer. They have a few different types of questions that they want to ask about data they have that already exists. And they're basically having a human do this, or maybe having a human do it until they understand the analysis enough to have it just be automated and do it weekly. Um, they're using things like SAS and Hive, which is a SQL query engine on top of Hadoop. Um, combining lots of different tools to have one hub that lets them answer a bunch of different types of questions. So sentiment analysis, path analysis, how do people click through the site, and customer segmentation, really common themes in retail that some of which is easy to do in normal relational databases, most of which is much easier to do in enterprise data warehouses, and Given your enterprise work data warehouse in Hadoop, you get a ton of different types of tools. That's really how Marks and Spencer is using this. And then the super fun time, which of course has the most complicated image, but I will try to make this all as approachable and simple as possible. Um, what we've got here, wait, does everyone know what this is? This is actually, this is a good learning opportunity. Does anyone, everyone, does, what, what is that? Can you tell from the shape of it? This is the database, yeah, it's a database symbol. So that means I'm storing some stuff there. This kind of looks like a, yeah. So databases and servers, great. <laughs> um, we have a bunch of databases and servers holding our data and then answering questions to us when we ping it a request. This is actually a tiny diagram of the Lambda architecture, which is a fancy name for having a batch layer which holds a lot of data a speed layer which holds some sort of views of data or views of answers to questions you might have, and then a serving layer which lets you quickly ping with a question and it'll try to look to the other two layers and answer it. And so what this means is that what, the, what this architecture is trying to address is you can do things in batch very slowly all at once. You can, you can try to keep running counters going and be less accurate. Those are the two normal strategies for how do I answer a question quickly, or how do I answer a question, do it in batch really slowly, try and keep approximate counters kind of running. Um, this is split the difference, and that's why I kind of like putting the serving layer in the middle. You have two different methods of trying to combine these things. Um, so this is a fancy type of architecture I'm not gonna talk about more specifically because I have a different one that's funner. <laughs> um, but if you hear Lambda architecture, it usually means someone's trying to sell you something fast fast and analytic. <laughs> um, an example of a company that actually uses the Lambda architecture, or more specifically, fast and analytic data processing to solve their problems is Cerner. So Cerner is interested in health data, data for patients. Um, they, in particular, wanted to monitor people that were at risk for sepsis. So you get admitted to the hospital, you get some sort of IV put in your arm, and you get an inf infection in your blood, it becomes very, very, very dangerous as a blood infection sounds. <laughs> and, but they have all of these instruments hooked, that people are hooked up to and they want to understand, well, given that we're constantly monitoring people, can we tell if they're going to get sepsis or if they're beginning to get septic before doctors would tell normally? And so what they need to be able to do is to ingest the data coming off of patient sensors really quickly and then understand um, given their view of that patient at the moment, whether or not they think they're going to be septic or not. So they, they need to organize their data for quick access, 
They need to organize model parameters for quick access. And they use HBase and MapReduce to, to accomplish this. Yes? Uh, so uh, I interned with uh, Siemens Medical Solutions once, which is now part of Cerner. And uh, one thing I took away from this experience was that it was extremely hard to do anything with patient data because of the legal requirements. So my question would be, how do you like interact with the company like that? Do you provide them with the technology, or are you running services for them on their infrastructure? How does it work? So the way Cloudera's licensing model works is that um, we give away our software. We give away most of our software for free. Some of our management software is not free. Um, we also sell a, a version that comes with the ability to call us day or night and have us answer your questions. And so we'll sell that software to a company like Cerner, they and they host it. But to the point of security, one of the things that Cloudera has recognized as being incredibly important in enterprise situations where you have huge amounts of data is being able to have security and tracing of who has accessed what pieces of data. Uh, and so we've added a lot to um, the Hadoop ecosystem around security and authentication. And so that makes working with HIPAA data much easier or working with um, PII data in credit card transactions and things like that. Um, but that was something that naturally in open source did not exist without the pressure of enterprises paying a company and telling them, hey, like we care about security, go do that. Um, yeah, so they're using pieces uh, of the Hadoop ecosystem here for indexing, organizing their data correctly, and adding in RDBMS because it's a wonderful, beautiful piece of technology that works. <laughs> and then basically combining these systems behind a simple facade, which is like a server that knows how to answer one question. You have a bunch of data, you're like, hey, is this person septic? You throw it at that server, you don't worry about it, and it comes back eventually like, yes, this person's about to go septic or not. And so indexing uh, and learning is usually, when people talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, I usually think of indexing. Almost everything comes down to, do you have enough parameters that are indexed correctly and can you access those fast? And that is usually the key of any sort of responsive machine learning application. And the majority of this is engineering, of just being able to get the data in the right place so that it's easy to throw some data at it and say, is this person septic? Yes or no? So machine learning is usually a tiny bit of math and a whole lot of software. So that, that consists of my view of the three pieces of data science that exist. Um, I'm now going to focus very specifically on operationalized machine learning models and how those can be scaled, what people mean when they say real time. <laughs> um, I think if you're interested in data and have an MBA, people are going to try and sell you things all the time. They're going to call it real time. I want to help you ask questions. I'm going to start over there and then just go back. Yes? You probably categorize data really fun time data science that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, how would you say that uh, math engineering balance is for people in each of those different roles? Does it differ in some systematic way or is it yeah. The data engineering is going to be pretty much all software engineering. And on the investigative analytics side, usually it, it depends on the size of the company and how data science is being run. Um, if it's a small company and you have one or two people on the team, they're going to need to be the ones that set up the databases. Um, like I, I have a friend that just started work at Stellar, which is like a Bitcoin competitor type thing. And her job right now is getting, like, she wants to do data science. She's going to be the one that answers all these questions, but they're not, like, the data is not in the right place. It's not on a database yet. So before she gets to use her, you know, uh, MIT degree in math, she needs to first get everything into a database or a few databases. Um, larger companies let you, usually let data scientists focus on the specific skills they bring to the table. And so if you look at Google, for example, the people that would be called, the people that translated out into a world that is not Google usually have the titles machine learning engineer or, um, oh God, some of the analyst. The, the analyst types, they end up using fancy Google systems 
but most of their interviews and what they actually do day to day is designing statistical experiments, looking at the results of them, and like really the, the specialized skills that very few other people have. And I think in, in modern data science, what I think is very, but what I think is a less common skill set is advanced math and machine learning. But practically, what you need more day to day in business is engineering. Because you need to get your data into the right place before anyone can really dig at it. I think someone this direction had a question. Yeah, I was going to ask about what you feel like this skill set is for someone who's more on the operational side. And you might have actually just answered that. But. Yes, heavy on the data engineering. Um, data engineering is the type of thing you learn through practice and having and like dropping data from databases and so it's it's the type of thing you learn from experience and experience is made up from by mistakes and so uh, if you're looking to hire data engineers or thinking about building out, building out that data engineering side you should hire people that have had uh, internships, mentorships, been a junior member of a data team um, so that they've seen what it means to track ETL processes well, how to recover from near catastrophic situations. Um, otherwise, they're going to learn that on the job and it might be pretty brutal. Other questions? Cool. So, um, I'm going to talk about a system already brought up called Kiji, which is an open source uh, software project that I worked on for a few years. And it has a few components to it. And what the company that was, that was trying to commercialize Kiji that I also worked for was ended up focusing on it doing was trying to build a real-time recommendation engine. So this is something like Amazon but you know, a company that felt threatened by Amazon, so a major US retailer that has some amount of online presence but isn't known for the online presence, could buy our software and then throw QG into this and, have, and then customize it to whatever they needed. So what is real time? People use the term real time a whole lot. And my best definition for it is fast. If you. I think that is the only thing that anyone will agree on. Real time is fast. Um, the actual technical definition of real time is best explained by this bomb. Um, if you look at this bomb, you know exactly how much time you have to diffuse it, right? Real time is exactly the same requirement where if you say a system is real time to a computer systems engineer or someone who makes pacemakers, what they think you mean is that given a specific deadline, this program will execute and return and it will be done. What this actually means when you go to conferences where people are trying to sell you data systems um, is it's fast and it's at least faster than whatever system it's trying to replace. So. My advice, if someone comes to you and they're like, I've got this really cool real-time system, is first think if you need the system. <laughs> and specifically, think of what your requirements are around latency. Do you care if it takes a day? A day seems like a long amount of time. OK, days may be too long. Do you care if it takes an hour, a minute, a few milliseconds? <coughs> uh, and this is not maybe this, like, if you can't answer that on your own, it's a great to, uh, go ask engineering teams what they think about the latency because people will try to, people will try to call anything real time. I've seen things called that take hours, hours for the, the process to complete be called real time. If it used to take a month, it sure seems better. <laughs> and so I think it's, it's worth asking questions about. And the thing that I sort of computed in, in my head and added at the last minute was last night it was like actually how many orders of magnitude does real time scale over it? Like, where are people using this and it's really anything from milliseconds which you know the, the latency of an RPC request where you send a request from one server to another is like tens of milliseconds um, avionics so airplane autopilots run at about 10 hertz and those are actual literal real time systems um, your, your airplane is this definition of real time. <laughs> and importantly for the rest of this talk, the response of a website is usually hundreds of milliseconds, or it should be hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, I believe Google 
ran a study of how long it takes for a website to return before a person loses interest. And because of that, they now have a well, they now have some sort of requirement around every a return from Google taking less than 250 milliseconds. And 200 to 250 milliseconds is the amount of website response time that I think companies generally should aim for. Yes? Uh, what's an RPC request? Ah. So it's called a remote procedure call. You're a server. I'm a server. We have a wire running between us. I want to say, hey, Pete, send me that thing. And you're like, OK, here's that thing. So me saying, hey, Pete, send me that thing was an RPC request. And then tens of milliseconds is the amount of time from the time that I said that to the time I received response. So why does real time matter? In, and OK, given that you can get whoever is trying to sell you something in real time or tell you about something in real time to specify what they mean by real time, uh, the next important question is, does it actually make a difference for the problem you're tr trying to solve? I think in the case of recommendations, it can make a difference depending on your problem. So there's a few ways that you can see that. In location-based offers, so let's say that I'm walking by a Starbucks. I have my cell phone in my pocket, and it, Starbucks can tell where I am. Uh, there's many ways they can do this, all of which are kind of creepy, but it's possible. And so it would be very beneficial for Starbucks, for example, to send a little push notification that says, hey, stop in for an afternoon coffee, dollar off, a little like coupon marketing campaign. Um, that kind of location awareness requires real time, or at least fast, uh, because if they see that you were next to a Starbucks yesterday, and then in their overnight batch job, they're like, oh, maybe you'd like to go to a Starbucks sometime. The relative value of those offers is hugely different. Um, similarly, fast in search results ends up being pretty important. No one really wants to sit there and be like, oh, I can come back tomorrow. Thanks. I'll, I'll be right back for that. And yeah, increasing important metrics. Who measures metrics anyway or analyzes them? other than data scientists, metrics. <laughs> uh, and like I said, relevance decays over time. And if you are changing from looking for hammers to repair your bathroom to uh, looking for a dress, you probably don't want to continue to get advertisements for hammers as your uh, interest shifts during a session. And so having constantly personalized, or even the concept of personalization, I think has pretty quick time decay, where the information that you're given about your current state and your current mood changes quickly. When, when you talk about uh, machine learning, is the, the input of the model, right? Because everything runs in a model. You, you set the model, and then you test the model, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is the machine also building up the model while she or he is receiving uh, input? Like, hey, this works better, this works better. Why it work better? What information do we have? Is the model also changing? Is he adding new variables? Is he taking variables out? So that's something that, so the, the structure of the model is almost never going to change. So I think in its simplest form, you have one model type that is being applied. The, that model has model parameters. And so uh, I th believe me when I say that the analog of, OK, this linear regression model has these model parameters ex extends to every model type in machine learning where you're, where you're trying to fit some model parameters and then apply it. The, a distinction that can be made is, are those model parameters changing as you get more data in, or are you updating them Irregularly, like irregularly, um, the Lambda architecture, one of the pieces I showed before, which has batch views, which you can imagine being the model, this batch view being the model trained from all data up until yesterday, and then speed views, which is the, the model information you need to update the model for everything you've seen currently. Um, the serving layer, what that can do is say, okay, hey, 
I want to apply this model, give me the last version and give me the views needed to update it to whatever I've seen recently and then it'll recombine those and give you a new one. And that's a way you can change your model parameters as, yeah, that's a way you can change your model parameters as time goes on and you get new data in. But it doesn't have to be that way. You could instead say, I think my model doesn't change that much in time. People's tastes can change in time. The model it's saying the same though doesn't, doesn't reflect a lack of real timeness in the model itself. It just means that the model is static. And so you can say, okay, I don't think my model changes that much. Like human individual taste might change a lot, but aggregate taste doesn't change that fast. And so if aggregate taste is not changing that fast, you can train on, on everything up until yesterday, never update it for another year, uh, and continue to use that model. And that is actually a fun piece that I will talk to you later, or I will continue elaborating on. Um, but that's an important distinction. Yeah? I guess to clarify that question, yeah. um, you know, we've talked a lot about training and scoring. Right? And so these are the two steps involved in machine learning. And so a simple way to understand this multiple layer uh, that you're talking about in the land architecture is that the, the training is sort of happening in, in, in batch, sort of happening more slowly than, than the scoring. And when it comes to identifying, you know, is this person likely to be a customer, you know, that requires speed. That has to be done very quickly. But the, the training has already happened, right? And so the, 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 is there a situation where you need the, the training to take place in, in real time? Words, yes. The information that's coming in is, is, is relevant in real time for the, uh, the, the, the model modification. We're not changing the model, but you know, the, the, the training part. Yeah. Um, so, point of clarification on uh, the Lambda architecture. So, you can think of the training happening in both the speed and the, sur and the batch layers. Um, the training means, okay, let's get the model parameters out. It's actually combining two views of like your, your view of very historic data with your view of yesterday's data or like up until a millisecond ago's data. And you have these two views and you know how to combine it in such a way that you can get your model out or your model parameters out. Um, the question of the distinction between applying models quickly and changing those model parameters quickly and when you might want to change model parameters quickly, it's usually when your aggregate taste in recommendations or the aggregate data set that you're looking at is changing a lot. So a, a clear example of this would be something like anomaly detection. So let's say you're trying to, let's say you, let's say you run, um, what is it, level three, um, the internet, provides, internet provider backbone. They have, they carry a huge amount of data. So Verizon is like the last mile of the internet. Level three is like one of those spinal cord parts. Um, let's say you're level three, you're watching internet traffic, and you start to see something weird over there. And you start to see something weird over there, and you're trying to do anomaly detection on all this internet traffic flowing through your systems. If you see a certain type of strange behavior in one part, and you recognize that as weird and strange in one part, you probably want to incorporate that information that like, oh, this seems really weird, look for other things like it, into your model. And that is something that the model parameters themselves should be changing under the hood. Um, but that is a distinct and orthogonal consideration to can you apply your model um, quickly when new information about the thing you're trying to score comes in. So when features change, do you apply your model fast versus those features were actually also part of the training process? How do you update your model parameters fast? Um, the Lambda architecture is meant to update model parameters. The Kiji project is more about how do you build a system that updates um, based on your features changing. Other than cost, what's the trade-off typically when you get when you're looking for more speed? Do you have to sacrifice something in your performance or? Yeah, so often accuracy. Um, a lot of the mathematical tricks that can be used to say, Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about collaborative filtering here. And in collaborative filtering, what you do is you usually say, oh, you three have similar taste based on your shopping history. Um, how, how can I combine her taste with his taste to get your taste? Um, 
and you try to find like weights to combine this. Um, usually that's originally formulated as you all have some sort of relationship in your shopping histories and you two might be very, very different, but I'm still going to add that term, but you two might be really, really similar. And so I'm going to add that term, but it'll probably actually have a large weight associated with it. A trick that can be used there is just considering the people that are really similar. And so you have, there's uh, these like hashing tricks that you can say like, oh, I can quickly bucket people into like you four are all kind of similar. And so just compute the similarities there. And so a lot of those approximation tricks can be used to increase the speed of how fast you can apply your algorithm. And so losing accuracy, but in machine learning, you're usually using, at least in my mind, you're usually using very uh, heuristic methods to extrapolate information from density, like from some density of data on, on in your space. And so you're already getting kind of heuristic-y wiggly anyway. And in a world of recommendation engines, the stakes are low. You know, you're not, again, controlling an airplane. Um, you're recommending to someone whether they want toothpaste or a different type of toothpaste. And so, accuracy. Okay. Um, so, in the Kiji project, how did we achieve real time? How do we handle millions of customers and users? Really low latency and be able to aggregate? Well, the answer is, of course, Hadoop and HBase. HBase is a distributed key value store, but really this just means a the way that it's organized, a table where you can imagine rows, columns, and then the cells that are in the table are actually have another dimension to them, which is the timestamp that they came in. So instead of a two-dimensional table, it's a three-dimensional table where we're stacking post-it notes with new times on top of it. So what is the Kiji project? Kiji pro project is open source modular framework for all different types of people <laughs> to collect, analyze, and use data in real-time applications. So let's take an example of this. Um, let's, we want to work on product recommendations. We have this guy named Doug Cutting. He works for Cloudera. Um, he is one of the creators of Hadoop. And we are keeping track of what links he's clicked on when doing searching and what items he's bought. So he's clipped, clicked on a link called Hadoop, <laughs> and he's bought a stuffed elephant at some point in his life. And so my derived recommendation is used is derived with a thing called a producer, which is a thing that can produce scores, does scoring of your features coming in. Uh, and it's going to say, OK, he probably wants some stuffed animals from this. We get new information about Doug. We want to be able to update the what we think is a good recommendation for him. So before, we're like, yeah, you probably want like 20 different stuffed animals. Here, we find out he's interested in column or storage and bicycles. And so we should probably get him an elephant riding a bicycle. And so the key point here is that the thing that is applying the model itself is exactly the same and has not changed. It's just that the information coming in is. So why would we want to do something like this? It's not super fancy. It could have been fancier in the sense of, oh, we could have the model parameters changing underneath the hood. Um, what, what is this buying us other than fast response time? Well, it's buying us quite a few things, actually. So if you look at most websites, you will find that not everyone uses them equally, right? You're going to have your power users over here. And then you're going to have the people that logged on once and just never come back. Um, so. If you were collecting data about all of those people and you were applying your recommendation algorithm to it in batch every night to, so as to re-update recommendations for people once a day, then you're going to be doing a lot of work for people who are never, ever going to come back. And being pretty late for people who are there on the website constantly clicking on things. So you're always going to have a few users with many interactions. A lot of users with few. And so the reason that we want to do this um, to only apply our recommendation and algorithm when someone has new information coming in is that it lets us do less work. Instead of doing this over and over again, we only do this when it needs to happen. So the way that we do this 
is through a many layered architecture. And so if you all start getting bored of this, honestly, five of you raised your hand simultaneously, I'll just move on. I wasn't actually sure how relevant this was to you, but I like talking about computers and you might absorb it, so. <laughs> um, we have a client, so this could be uh, some, well, a website that's serving for us that, that gets a request from one of our users, and that, <laughs> it could be a person clicking on a thing that triggers a, hey, let's make a new recommendation to put in a carousel on the side of this web page for them. So a server sends out a request, like, give me a list of recommendations. It first goes to our special server, which is the I know how to score things fast. So KG scoring. And what it'll do is it'll go to HBase and be like, hey, HBase, I hear you have this column called recommendations. Um, go find that column called recommendations. Give me what the results are for this person. And I'll say, and HBase will be like, huh, okay. That seems like a clever idea. Um, it'll return this information. And if those recommendations say uh, were computed three days ago, and we have a freshness policy that says, I actually really, really care that no one gets recommendations older than 20 seconds, five minutes, 200 milliseconds, whatever you want to set it at. Um, then what this will do is it will say, okay, well, you just got back a three-day-old recommendation. I think we can do better. And it'll look at its watch and say, right now we're at 100 milliseconds. We have 150 milliseconds left. Let's go see if we can compute new recommendations in time. So. It'll try to compute new rec recommendations with that producer, uh, given that it was three days old. And so if, it gets, if the new recommendations get returned within that 150 milliseconds, so we get 250 milliseconds total to, to compute, compute the thing that we want to show and actually generate that web page. If it returns in time, then great. We'll toss that back to the client. And if it doesn't, that's fine. We'll take whatever we computed here, save it back to this database for later, having updated our recommendation. Thrilling, right? And so, yep, if you returned in time and we're all done, you can return it to the client, write it back to our database, we're ready to keep going in our beautiful world. This is the stack that exists. I've already described this more or less. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, among your customers or clients, you know, what is the range of uh, website load latencies that they're satisfied with? You say 250 milliseconds. Do some say you know, 2.5 seconds is fine? Yes. So, uh, the, the numbers you have, well, 2.5, I think anyone would say is probably way too large. Um, most, most companies would be, I think it depends on the type of company. Um, at at Weeby, I think most people kept it under 500 milliseconds. Um, if you want to be aggressive and make sure you never lose eyes looking at your website, because it might cost you billions of dollars, like the case of Google, um, they're stricter. So how do you make things freshenable? Um, I kept talking about this like, like a freshening process where you know, we try to read that recommendation column, see if it's new or not, and if not, updated. So how do you make things updatable? Well, as mentioned, back to the parameter changing part. Um, popu like my, my assumption with recommendation engines in general so population interests change slowly. This actually might not be true. Like, I hear Game of Thrones just came out, and my guess is a lot of people are really excited about that over the last few days, and they have been, or, you know, two or three months ago. Just a guess. <laughs> um, but for many retail products, it's not actually changing that fast in terms of population taste or relationships between tastes. Um, but individual interests are changing quickly. You know, you go from looking at, uh, hammers to books about math or whatever. So population interest changing slowly means the models don't need to be retrained frequently. You don't have to get new model parameters all the time. Um, there are definitely situations where model parameters should change and need to change, but understanding that distinction between like is my machine learning like is my machine learning algorithm fast enough or real time enough doesn't mean that it's responding to population changes and overall broad model changes or just to new features changing. Oh, I was wondering where that box went. 
here. If I do this really fast, you can see it all together, right? Um, so scoring a model should be fast. I should never try messing with slides. <laughs> I tried to like realign them last night. I think I added animation. I have a question on the previous yeah. slide. Um, so those are two different things or two different models depending on how slow or how fast interest change. So, um, so I think this could be the same model. Okay. So that um, just to be able to score it, meaning you have your model parameters somewhere easily accessible. But actually, okay, I'm a person. Um, here's my overall data, like all, and this is my model data. I'm going to train down here. And this is going to result in a process that writes out parameters to some, it could be a database, it could be a file, it could be an in-memory representation that has the numbers in the right place. Um, but raw data goes here. From that, you extract model parameters. And the thing that needs to be fast is being able to access these model parameters quickly, not necessarily re-update the model parameters quickly. So I need to be able to come here and be in line and ask like, hey, I'm doing linear regression. What is my coefficient for x? And this should tell me that really quick. But this doesn't need to update. Does that help, that diagram? So, oh, yeah. Common workflow was you train your model over your entire data set. And then the output of your training step is model parameters that you know how to access. So this could be a bunch of key value pairs that have to go into a giant database. Um, this could be recommendations of you liked this item, here are 10 other items associated with it. These could be literal weights on linear regression or some sort of regression algorithm. What's important is you're summarizing the relationships in your data in some, into some sort of model. You serialize it and you save it somewhere. So a database, a file. Uh, and then when you need to actually go and apply your model, it's already there, it's pre-computed, it's easy. And so uh, the way that you can change this from pre-computed is to make the place that you're saving your model parameters changeable. And that's kind of how you can think of the Lambda architecture as working or other methods of ha having changeable model parameters. So instead of saving it to a file, which is hard to update, you can save it to a database and update different parts of your database as things change. So, um, yeah, so as we get new information, what matters is this producer, the thing that's producing new scores for all of your inputs, um, gets updated. Pretty much running out of time. Let's see if we can get somewhere interesting with this. So I'll talk a little bit about the, how do you make things faster? Um, the way that these models actually get represented for recommendation systems, you usually think about them in a matrix where each row is a user and each column is an item. There are a few different methods that you can use for making recommendations based on this. One of the most commonly used one, or class, one of the most commonly used class of methods is called collaborative filtering, which basically uses the principle of what I mentioned before where, oh, you know, you people have similar taste. And so I think you know that all that this group of people has similar taste. I'm going to infer what you might like based on people you're similar to. So if we think of each person as being rep represented by these rows, then we can compute similarity measures of these two rows. And and combine these using interesting weights. So we get into the problem of finding similar users. We have millions and millions of users. We have millions of rows in this matrix. We could do all n squared comparisons. That would take a long time. <laughs> really, really long time. And so what uh, is sort of the fun, fancy, awesome way to go about doing this is as I mentioned before, the way to make this faster is to use an approximation. So you could compute all pairwise distances. Instead of doing that, 
you can use what I call poor man's clustering. So this is a hashing scheme. Um, it's a special trick that you can use to find things that are probably close to one another given a certain distance measure. So if you like mathy things, you should look up this stuff. But in particular, if you're looking at cosine similarity, which is uh, the most common similarity between um, vectors or features that you would use in collaborative filtering, it basically says if you have two rows that represent vectors, and you draw the vectors, you're going to take the similarity to be the angle between them. So if they kind of if they lie close together in a similar space, then they're pretty similar. So you could compute the cosine similarity again for all of these cross comparisons. And, but instead, what we're going to do to be really fast about this is to use poor man's clustering, which is basically says, OK, I have a hashing function, which is a completely deterministic function that just takes an input, returns a much smaller output, which is basically a cluster label. That's how I think of it. Um, you give it an input and it says, oh, that thing's in cluster B. OK, great, that thing's in cluster B. And then you suddenly have your data set partitioned into different clusters, and you can compute the similarities just inside of there. So other than speed and paying up for more expensive hardware, hiring really expensive mathematicians to do this for you is another way to speed it up. <laughs> um, I actually recently gave a talk that uh, ended with a comparison of Moore's law, so um, like transistors, resistors, double on chips, uh, and seems to be doing that incredibly exponentially fast. And there was a head of SIAM, so the Society for Industrial and Applied Math, who regularly gets asked to go to Congress and tell Congress why math research should be funded. And he brought this graph that was a line representing Moore's law versus the years out from the discovery of you know, tiny chips, basically. Uh, and then looking at mathematical methods that can speed up the computer problems they were doing at the time. So this was particularly um, linear solvers for large partial differential equation simulations, so climate simulations, nuclear bomb experiments, things like that. Um, and you could see the mathematical algorithms being on par or just surpassing the things that they could buy with Moore's Law. And so some things can be fixed with really fast, fast computers. And some things get fixed with mathematicians saying, yeah, it's a fine approximation. This is how you can speed it up. And that's why I like this a lot. And yeah, recommendation engines. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs>